All right, we're going live and welcome everyone. Everyone, as you are logging in, I hope that you have had a wonderful uh, holiday season and that you have enjoyed welcoming the new year in. Something nice. <laughs> um, so I want to welcome all of you. And as we're, uh, you know, as people are jumping into the chat room and joining us live, uh, if you want to share some of your goals that you've set for 2017, if you want to share a little bit about any resolutions you may have made, feel free to over here in the chat box, um, because we're all about goal setting here at Association Chat. It's nice to see everyone. Ah, Lara, yes, not resolutions, intentions. So she's all about intentions. I am a massive goal setter. I just like throughout the year, I love doing this, but I don't enjoy it nearly as much as I do when I look at something like a brand new year and I'm like, ooh, what do I want to accomplish within this next year? I get really excited. What do you think, Tom? I, we're going to uh, save I'm, the best for last. Well, first but. of all, Kiki, I always appreciate the opportunity to be here on Association Chat. I love this show. I think it's the number one <laughs> show in association world. I love seeing people come out who want to just really be better because it's these moments when we listen to people who are doing things pretty well. And we don't have it perfect here, but I love, I've been doing this 20 years, I love the opportunity to share one or two things that we're doing really well that I know transcends all associations can help change them. And, and I'm a huge goal setter too. And I think you mentioned earlier, you we might dig in a little bit of that, yeah. but you know, as I, as I said, I, I think if you don't set goals, you do not know where you're going. And sometimes that's an exploration process for people, but I, it's been proven that if you set goals and when you set goals, you must write them down and, and have a point down the road that you're checking in on them to see where are we? And if there's a gap, if it's a serious goal, what are we going to do to make up the difference? So we, uh, we get it by the end of the year. Yeah, absolutely. I totally agree. And we are, we're going to dig into it. I think uh, I've seen that we have several people, more people signing on, more people logging in. So we're going to go ahead, it's 202. Let's go ahead and uh, get started with this, this week's association chat. Yeah. We're going to kick it off. It's finally 2017. It's time to say goodbye to the past and hello to what's coming in this new year. And with each new year comes new changes. And it's important for associations to be able to adapt to them. Associations will be facing immense change in every aspect of our society. And luckily, Luckily, Association Chat has got you covered for the changes to come in the association world. Now, most people make New Year's resolutions that they don't stick to, but we're here to help you find out how your association can own the future with just six key elements. And for those that need a refresher or just recently became fans of Association Chat, Tom Tom Morrison, CEO of Metal Treating Institute, MTI Management. Hey, by the way, that's not to be confused with the Mental Treating Institute. <laughs> <laughs> There's two different associations. Two different MTIs. Just want to and, clear that up. I could see you being CEO of either <laughs> one, Tom. I don't know. Many people who've met me at a meeting have said, I could definitely see you running that show. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Well, more about Tom. Tom, you you became a certified life coach, and you have authored um, you've authored a groundbreaking book on personal development that's called "How to Get People to Scream Your Name and Beg for More." And it, as part of that book, you're talking about the diff four different components that everyone needs to be focused on in their lives to achieve the best quality of life possible. So while you've done that. Um, you clearly, you're, you're mindful, you're thoughtful about people's personal lives and what they are doing to achieve success in their lives in all different ways. Mm -hmm. But you're also an association executive and yes. you have been leading MTI all of these years and uh, through many changes, many challenges and helping them to embrace change as different as as the times change and we are certainly facing a lot of uh quick paced fast paced change so tom you're here to gift us with your knowledge on the six key elements associations need to make 2017 their year welcome welcome to association chat 
Well, so, you know, you mentioned a great thing that you talked about the transition of personal and being very uh, satisfied there. I'm a big believer that if we're not as association executives, we're not personally fulfilled, we'll never be professionally fulfilled. And that's the same with our members. Our members come to our meetings and they're just kind of down or, or they're kind of rocking through life. And sometimes it's because they're going through the motions and they're not as per personally fulfilled as they'd like to be. So I've encouraged all execs to, you know, to buy my book and really walk through that place. Because once you're per personally fulfilled, um, your, your professional fulfillment can, can not do nothing but drive and go higher because you're you're not trying to suck the life out of your professional because you're trying to fill your personal life. If the only thing filling your personal life is professional stuff, then you're totally losing out on why you exist and what your purpose in life is. So I encourage people to really dig down deep into, you know, what do you want to achieve personally in terms of relationships, financials, mm -hmm. career, and health? Those are the four key elements that drive all of our quality of life issues. So I really get people to really kind of focus in on those. And once you've got that, you come to work with smile, with purpose, with laughter, with all these other things. And then you're totally prepared right here because our members want this. What they want every day is what's right here in our gut and our heart. And what that number one thing I feel that association people are looking for in 2017, especially coming out of this polarizing political climate that we came through 16, they're looking for hope. They're looking for an organization to connect themselves in with that when, man, when they leave them, when they pay their dues. I'm crying, people, but I'm oh also. My gosh, <laughs> I, I was like, man, I'm bringing you to tears. Girl. This is incredible. I'm also got allergies. No, but so they're, they're, look, they're looking for hope. And here's what hope stands, in my opinion. The mm -hmm. H stands for someone with a hell of an attitude. When people mm -hmm. are talking to you, they want to hear a hell of an attitude. They want to be encouraged that you can make it. I used to tell my members in 2009, when many of our members' sales dropped off over 50%, and they would call me just to talk. And I'm like, look here, man, manage your costs, manage your labor, the two big things, grow revenues as fat, as hard as you can, but just make it through 2009. If you make it through 2009, you're going you're gonna to have record sales for the next five years because many people who aren't managing well are going to go away, and that's going to leave fewer suppliers for more business. And let me tell you, so many people told me in the middle of 2010 that they so appreciated me when they called me. And I just say, look, just do whatever it takes to make it to the next year. And they did. They hunkered down. So they want people with a hell of an attitude that can really drive them to be best. Um, the, the second one is optimism. No one wants to hear how bad things are. I mean, in every bad place, I, say, I always talk about it. If you're in a dark room, all you need to do is simply close your eyes and reopen them and you'll see the light through the pinhole and that's where you go to and that's what people need want to hear from their association they want to hear optimism they want real reality but there's optimism in any year no matter how bad it is because guess what somebody's making money in down economies and you want your members to be that right and the third thing is passion we all i mean we're association execs we have the greatest job in the world to help make a difference in people's lives and passion is that one thing that well, i want all of my staff i want all of my volunteers i want that to exude out of them like nothing before. And, you know, when you look at, um, I just read a note that the consumer confidence right now after December is at an all time high after 50, oh, since 15 years ago. So consumerism and people are feeling good about at least where we are financially as a, as a society right now. So I think we're on the cusp of some really cool things. And I'll give you some data here in just a little bit when we talk about the lost generation that's going to blow your mind. And the last thing of hope, is energy. When people step into your presence, they don't want to be dragged down. When they come to your association and plug in, they want to feel energized with a refreshing and refueled perspective on what they can look forward to in their industry. Because many of us represent business owners or individuals who are their own boss. Mm -hmm. And a lot of us represent people who work for others. And they want to plug in and say, wow, this industry is awesome. I'm in and I'm energized by it because my association is showing me what the opportunities are in the future. So that's really, for me, going to 16, that is what we're focused a lot on is projecting that, that hell of an attitude, the optimism and the passion and the energy. So when people look at us, I like when people call me just because they go, you know what? <laughs> I just want to talk to you guys because I feel so good when you leave the conversation. Yeah. Um, so that's really kind of element one that, that I think associations need to really test their staff on and say, are you really passionate when you come in here? When you answer the phone, does members hear that hell of an attitude from you that, you can make it and you're going to make it because we're going to be here for you. And that's what this is. Anybody can have this, but it's this right here that pulls people to the association in an mm -hmm. emotional way. You know, what I, what I love about what you're saying is that um, everything that you're saying here 
is really speaking to the power that we have as human beings to be able mm -hmm. to connect and, and emotionally connect with other people. And it, at a time when I don't know if, if you've read or listened to the, the Inevitable by Kevin Kelly or any of this discussion about, you know, what's coming in the future, you talk about the Uberization of mm -hmm. associations and all of this different stuff. And we're going to get right into that. I'm leading there. Mm -hmm. But, um, but the thing is, is that a lot of this focus is on how AI and, and robots are going to come in and take over so many of the, the pieces that we don't need to do as humans. But that piece of emotionally connecting with another human being and being able to have that, that engagement, that right. relationship, that, that is a strength. And so, so the time that we're living in right now, you know, associations are running and they're building and we keep seeing things moving and changing faster and faster. It seems faster and faster. So my first question, my first official question to you, what do you think is driving this rapid pace of change? You know, Kiki, we're in a mode of change right now. Well, we're going to see in the next three years. That's why my talk that I do called What's Your Uber? Are You Ready for 2020? Mm -hmm. We are, by the time we get to 2020, we're going to see more change in the next three years than we've seen in the previous 10. Okay. And I think it's because we have two things. We have demand for change because us as consumers, we are demanding. There's three things in every business model. There is friction, anxiety, and stress. And that friction, anxiety, and stress is driving us to want something different because I have friction, anxiety, and stress in doing business with this person. And I'm, I'm demanding someone bring me another business model or another app or another thing that will take that friction, anxiety, and stress out of, the, out of the process and make it so much easier to do business with me. So I think the consumers are demanding it, but more so they're expecting it because you see how we've been conditioned to see how fast change is happening. The other thing I think is driving it is supply. Used to, you had to have big dollars and seasoned executives that went into rooms and they did demos, they did all kinds of stuff. And now you have 18 year olds becoming billionaires over a couple of years with an idea. You look at the guy that developed Oculus, mm -hmm. the virtual reality glasses. He was bought by, he was a 20 year old, um, second year student in college and developed those virtual reality glasses. And Facebook bought him, it was either Google or Facebook bought him for $2 billion after two years. Yeah. So change is coming at our fingertips supply side too. So the two of those are combining, but with those combined, the three things that are really driving change is, um, is obviously the demographic shifts that we're going in right now. Uh, the emerging technologies that are coming at us at fast pace. And then the consumer behavior patterns with all the change, how they're buying stuff, why they want to buy it. And you know, you're funny. You talked about robots. Well, and artificial intelligence, I think, I hope, I hope this news story was a fake news story. So a relationship friend of mine who's a counselor posted how some woman in England is um, building a, a, a robot that she wants to marry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, all right, now we're taking the relationship to a new level. Wow. Yeah. But, it, but, it, but it's, 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 it's freakish in, in, in the types of demands and supply and how it's all changing so fast. Um, but I think it's just those three things in my mind, emerging technologies, um, demographic shifts and consumer buying habits changing. Those three things are happening and they're all crossed. It's like a trifecta and they're causing it to happen so fast. So with all of this change happening, you know, um, a big thing that that you talk about, that I talk about is making sure that we always provide value. You mm -hmm. know, um, how can I provide value to you as my friend, as my colleague? How can you how can an association provide value to their members? And so when it comes to talking about value, what should associations be focusing on right now? You know, I go back to the mantra that I've said since 2009, that associations, there's three types of benefits that any association can be offering. There's ones that they, they can get for free and Google and Yahoo and Bing have owned those forever. Um, then there's ones that you're going to do anyway, like government relations and meetings. A lot of members will say, well, you're going to do that anyway without me. But then there's the thing that I've always said that doing things your members can't do themselves effectively. And those are things that members could possibly do. But they can't do them very effectively. I know for a fact that members cannot do benchmarking. We've been talking about big data for like two years now is the big thing. It's the big thing of the future. Well, big data is benchmarking, being able to predict the future from data we get from historical trends from all of our members. 
members can't get that data because the competitors are not going to give their competitor all the data to, to order to combine it to come up with some formidable report. So the association is the one group that can stand in the middle and say, all of y'all give us all your data in a secure, trustworthy fashion, and we're going to spin it back out to you in ways that will help you predict the future. Our association partnered with a group called ITR Economics last year. These, this group, they're the number one forecasting company in the country. They have a 94% of, um, uh, approval rating of predicting the future um, the last 60 years. They predicted all the ups and downs in the economy with a 95% accuracy. That's the kind of things when you're spending, you know, when you're basing a lot on the future economic elements of how, how you're going to be successful, how much you invest in equipment, labor, those kind of things. Man, when you can be 95% accurate in what it's going to look like one, two, and three years down the road, yeah. that is huge value. Training is another one of those things. Now, some people have a lot of competition through sister associations and stuff, but training is another well element. Um, uh, just, you know, young development, leadership development is another thing. So I, I really encourage associations to do one thing. They must look at their members' businesses and the business model and find out where the friction anxiety and stress is in that business model. Mm -hmm. And if they can circle a, a benefit around taking that out of the system for their members, they've created the highest level of value they can ever get in their association because it makes life easy and makes it stress-free. Um, and I just saw a great dynamic of people always ask and say, Tom, where does friction, anxiety, and stress happen in the business? And it happens in uh, just a few places. It happens in the delivery of the product. So, you, you know, like Uber, Uber is a perfect example of how the delivery of taking someone from point A to point B, they blew the taxi cab industry away with how they delivered that. Then there's the customer experience. There's sometimes a lot of friction in the customer experience. Amazon is totally blowing everybody away with their customer experience and their service and how they deliver stuff. Then it could be your, it could be the product itself. There could be some, uh, some changes that need to be made in the product. And then operations, there's a lot of friction, anxiety, and stress and the operations of how someone's company operates. And, and the best thing to do there is go to your employees and ask them, go to your association employees or your member employees and say, tell us on the plant floor in your executive offices, where do you feel like we could take out unproductivity and friction in the, in the system, you know, and build stuff on that. And the last one that I think is really key, and I talk a lot about this in my, in my keynote, is the foundational business model for an industry as a whole. There are industries out there that the way they do business as a whole is flawed because now it's old because mm -hmm. apps and software and just the demands of the consumer are changing it. So associations need to be right in the middle of that business model trying to help their members figure it out. And that's where the high level value and, and for MTI, I've put out a little graphic here. We boiled it down into a, a, a octagon shape, six things, and you can see the middle there. That's not our mission statement. When I'm talking to a business owner and I say, look, we live to maximize your profits and your productivity. I suck his heart right into it. He's like, how do you do that? <laughs> like, well, we help you with studies to manage your number one cost, which is labor. We help you forecast the future with 95% accuracy. So when you want to invest in that $5 million piece of equipment, you can do it with, with absolute confidence. Or you may not invest in it because if we're going to be only 1% growth in the next two years, do you really want to make the $5 million investment? Probably not. So we just saved you $5 million. Horrible mistake. So, um, you know, so I think that's where associations need to dig into is ask themselves at all levels, where's the friction, anxiety, and stress in our association, our business model, and our member companies, and figure that out. And it'll draw you to the highest level of member value you can get anywhere. You know, what's so interesting about what you just said is that, um, that I see that occasionally, you know, you see connections and ties into, you know, one person's realm um, and, and your own. And so, like, for example, on this chat, a lot of times people will say something and what's working for them or what is a rule that tends to work for them in one area, I'll see connections to what I'm doing. And same thing. And if you look at SEO, and this is just really quick, if you look at SEO, the hair on fire problem is oftentimes the secret to content that you should be developing because that's what people need help with. That's what they care about. That's, that is where you can provide value. So just like Tom was talking about, you can, um, you can look at that as, as ways to definitely focus your energies in that, in that regard. But then also even in your content, you can look at that and be thinking, okay, where are people really struggling and how can I, how can I uh, help them with that? 
right. even in developing your content, that'll, that'll help you even get better search results. But anyway, on to back. Well, <laughs> well, real, well, really quick. I mean, my good friend, Mark D on here, Mark Dorsey, I can see he just yep. made a comment about how, yep. how Uber is becoming commoditized and how they're losing a little bit. And, and you know what, what yep. that tells you right there is just how fast it can change. Cause when they came out for five years, no one can compete. Then Lyft entered yeah. the system and now they have, we have a, a system that only serves females for safety reasons and stuff. And so that, I mean, I agree with Mark that, you know, they don't, they don't have the big thing as it was. They still have a great competitive advantage, but people got to understand Uber doesn't want to own taxi cabs. They want to own transportation. They want to own taking flowers from point A to point B, right. taking pizza from point A to point B. But in just five years, as big a competitive advantage as they had, they're, they're also losing a little bit of ground because of changing disruption and competition. Yeah. So just because you're out in front does not mean you own the day. Oh man. And let's not even talk about self-driving cars. That's a whole, we're going to go way down that rabbit hole. Um, let's talk about communication strategies though, mm -hmm. because you know, with this, ch with the changes and with uh, the different approaches to providing value to members, how do you think that associations should approach their communication strategies in the middle of chaotic change? Well, you know, communication strategies, I've talked to so many associations and they're really their, their communication strategy. You got the member in the center and the arrows are running all around about what they do, weekly emails, and th yeah. they got different content going to different segments. And I think members want a very clear and concise strategy that helps them get the information they need every day to be successful. And I kind of have a selfish motive in things of like video. I was talking to you earlier about when I came on, it's very, I needed a way as a CEO to be in my 350 member plants all the time. And I can't do that physically. So I developed um, MTI TV and we haven't done them in a couple of months because we got more focused on other video content. But every other week it was a video that I would cut about five minutes worth of news. Sometimes I was interviewing a member like this, but I was in their computers talking to them about life, about business, about our industry. And I had many members who I'd meet for the first time and say, Tom, I feel like I already know you because what they got to hear is they got to shake my hand electronically and they got to hear my passion. Those things I talked about at first, they got to hear that hope through the CEO's eyes that looks and look, we are here for you and no one's going to take that away from you. So you can call us, do whatever it takes. Um, so I think communication, I think video is a big key. We're about to launch something in 2017 called Heat Treat Tuesday, which is a conversation just like this with three members who are deep in the, we have a lot of technical standards that go on in our industry. And the problem is, is that most of our members don't get an understanding of what is happening. It's kind of like government. You know, we don't get an understanding of what's going on and what's been passed until it's too late. And then it's thrust upon us to have to adhere to. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a, a program just like this, where three experts that are in those rooms, looking at those standards can on a monthly basis, tell members what's being discussed, what's happening, getting feedback. And we're bringing what's going on in the small room in the back with a dozen to 25 people out into the open and transparency. And we're and, and all of a sudden members are going to say, this is great. And I told you earlier, one of our members was on one of these calls like this, our technical standards call. And he said, Tom, you saved me a half a million dollar purchase on a piece of equipment because he learned in that call that a rule change that was going to happen. They decided not to make the rule change. Mm -hmm. And it saved him from having to buy a half a million dollar piece of business or, mm -hmm. or piece of equipment. That's what we talk about value. That was a huge value to him. So the value in our communication structure is trying to get meaningful not, you know, content that's how do you manage your people better? How do you do this? It's bringing on what's going on in the industry that is changing so fast that we need to pay attention to in our business every day. And every association has those types of content going on. And they can, the easiest way to get it out is speak to someone for 30 to 45 minutes right online just like this. And you can watch it um, or you can record it and see it later. Um, yeah. The other thing I think that's really crucial, Kiki, in the communication is that it, it's associations really – centralize their communication instead of having, you know, 10 emails that go out from 10 different departments, one email a week, it has links to those 10 departments, you know, to make sure that it, you want to get your stuff read. Mm -hmm. And those that are looking to go electronic versus print, bad move in these days until you're getting 90% of people opening up your, your, um, uh, your emails, I think you need to have a paper strategy. Our print publication is 12 pages and it is not, it's not content driven. It's content driven, but we look at it as marketing. Mm -hmm. Our members still look yeah. at it. I walk into any one of our member companies and there's two newsletters sitting by their telephone and they're looking <laughs> at our logo every day. 
I was just gonna, that makes me think of something, you know, that is so true. And, and there is so little direct mail that's going out now because people, of course, it's cheaper, you know, to be able to communicate electronically and it's important to be able to do that. So it's, yes, so it's portable and it's mobile and all of that's very important, but the power of a really well-produced piece that you mm -hmm. hold in your hand. I know people look at me and they're like, you focus on digital marketing. Why are you talking? About I love really well-produced mm -hmm. physical like pieces, direct mail that you hold in your hand, but like you can see the trend, you can see sort of, um, and this is even, I picked this up at Barnes and Noble and they take the time to put these little things in here. And it's all, this is about mindfulness, yeah. but but the point is this, is that people are taking the time to put out pieces that are really unique and different. And so think about that in terms of both the aesthetic and in the content. I think that that can get you a lot further because frankly, who gets mail that's not bills now? I mean, right. like if you get something in the mail that is different, mm -hmm. you hold on to it. It's, right. it's unusual. It stands out. Well, that's why this piece right here is so powerful because this piece here in a concise way clearly communicates our value proposition to anyone. And, it, and it's, it's, it's easy enough to be able to put on any business card or flyer. And we developed it. And like for our industry, we have 50 associate suppliers who all have about six sales reps. And mm -hmm. that's 300 people sitting in all those non those non members every single week. And so we're our strategic planning in one more week. We're going to be talking about how do we incentivize or leverage that 300 people to every time they go into one of those businesses, all they simply do is say, look, here's an application. This is a great organization we're connected, we're connected with. You should be a member five minutes and it takes them no time. Um, we're even considering giving them 500, five, $100 bills. If they join going back to Ron Rosenberg's um, philosophy that if they could be a member for 10 years at $1,600 a year in dues at $16,000, would you pay 500 in the first year to get them? The answer is yes. Wow. So we're looking at it yeah. being really creative. That goes back to a, a clear marketing strategy that helps you leverage people that you're connected with who are connected to your members. Yeah, yeah. And, and Scott's uh, joining in here saying direct mail can still work very well. It needs to be targeted and personalized to have the highest effectiveness. That said, if it is a print piece that is distributed personally, a well-designed piece will still attract attention. He could um, not be, he, he is right on. We literally about once a quarter, we send out a, a report to all of our non-member companies and, it, and, and we forget to really communicate directly the member value. And this last one we sent out had a report and on, it had the, the year's growth rates for 27 industries. Our members serve and spend money to get, and we showed 2015 and then we showed, we blocked out 2016, 17 and 18 growth rates and said, if you're, if you were a member of MTI, you would see these numbers clearly every single quarter. And we mm -hmm. got in two new members the next week. So, wow. you know, we, we, we send that out on a constant basis because that information is vital to them. And I know a lot of associations get caught up in trying to sell smoke and mirrors is what I've heard. And they sell perceived value. If you're not selling actual value, you're, they're never going to be longtime members. I you know, love you got to get, get down to what's actual meaningful to your company and what keeps them up at night. You know, that's a really, that's an interesting thought because yeah, you learn about perceived value and that becomes a focus, but maybe that was a focus for too long because you know, that's pretty short sighted perceived value for how long mm -hmm. you have to, before at some point somebody goes through and reevaluates what they're spending and why they're spending it. And they say, okay, am I really getting what I thought I was going to get out of this? And if the answer is no, I mean, this is like, you know, my own personal budgeting. <laughs> if the answer is no, I'm not getting anything out of this, then you stop, you, well, well, think, you do whatever. Think about it. Once they wake up and go, wait a minute, this has no actual real value, they're done. Yeah. And you've lost yeah. them forever. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I want to I wanna speak to um, something that I read on your blog, okay? Uh -huh. And you recently released a blog on what you call the, the lost generation, which I have to tell you, so, you know, um, in English classes, when I was in college, the last generation, I was thinking, okay, so what's he talking about this, you know, some of the writers maybe from post-World War One or something. <laughs> 
uh, some of the famous writers of the lost generation, but you're not talking about them. You're talking no. about a new lost generation. So, yeah. so who is your lost generation and why are they so important to associations? So look at this, you should be paying attention to this. So that's, that's, <laughs> that is the birth rate since 2005. The lost generation is the one right in the center, Gen X. That's Gen good. X is between 33 and 53 right now today. So the baby boomers are between um, 54 and 73. Okay. They're moving out. And we have never, I've never been to one session at any meeting ever that said, what are we going to do to get Gen X in? No, everything's all about the, everybody, <laughs> everything's all about the millennials, but here's the no thing. No one ever cared about me. The, millenni the millennials are only 32 years of age. Baby boomers did not join a thing unless they were required to when they're in their twenties, they got to thir early thirties and said, you know what? I think I see value in this stuff. I don't know it all. So I've got to get it. So Gen X, I'm telling everybody I can get my hands on. It's imperative today because Gen X is the here and now. And here's the key. Here's the crucial thing, Kiki. Everybody wonders why their memberships are flat um, and why the, the, uh, the, you know, the economy's flat, why a ton of things are flat. Well, it's because if you go back to this, this graph, there are 13 million fewer Gen Xers than there are baby boomers. There's less people in the system as clients right now for us. So you got to get a higher percentage of Gen Xers just to do anything and break even. So it's imperative upon every association to engage Gen X today and engage them because they're the here and the now. They're your leaders. And some of them are pissed. Excuse the French. Some of them are when I talk about this, they, they, I see people in the back going, yes, somebody's finally talking about us. Mm -hmm. But they're, they, they have an emotional disconnection with millennials in a lot of respects because this kind of they got skipped because they had there just weren't enough of them born. Mm -hmm. So any association that is speaking to what the Gen Xers believe and want and desire are going to get vibrant, more attracted um, and loyal uh, volunteers. They're going to get more members. But remember, you got... 13% fewer to choose from. So you get, I mean, that's why the workforce thing, that's why there's a, a problem in the workforce right now. We got 13 million fewer people to spread around to work. All those people that are teachable, trainable, can work and have a good work ethic are already working. There are no more people sitting out there looking for jobs that are highly trained, highly, highly trained. They're all working. Um, now here's the cool thing though. You look at the millennials, they're 32 years of age. We're about to go on the largest, I don't care what industry it is. We're about to go on the largest growth in the economy and our history in the automotive world and the home buying world. Think about the stat. The 80s and 90s changed our world. The 80s and 90s. Guess what age the, the baby boomers, who at that time were the largest generation in history, in 1977, three years before 1980, they were 32 years of age, hmm. the baby boomers. We're 2017, and the generation Y, the millennials, are 32 and about to shake up the think about this when i talk about the 20s and 30s i think back back to 1920 we're about to hit the 20s and 30s in the millennial century and the and the millennials are going to totally transform both of those centuries so between here and 2020 it's imperative upon us and associations to get ready for that growth because they're we're going to see a renaissance in our economy and our wealth in the 20s and 30s in like ways we've never seen since the 80s and 90s. Why? Because there's there's a hundred million millennials coming to our U.S. economy into their 30s in the highest income producing years, the next 25 years. So we're going to see growth in everything under the sun that you can't imagine. So this is this is where I have to pull back because as, as you're talking, it's like exciting, exciting, exciting. I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm with you. And then it's like, who okay this is this is getting overwhelming i don't know i don't i don't know what i'm supposed to do for 2017 anymore there's how can i plan for the future and bring in gen x and all the stuff that i'm supposed to do so i'm going to ask you what is the one thing that associations should do in 2017 to grab the hearts and the souls of their members they need well one they need to learn about they need to learn about the hearts of gen x mm -hmm. and specifically go after some messaging that would say we're here for you and you're important to us mm -hmm. because there's a disconnection there because all they all they see they're sitting there watching you go millennial 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 and millennials right. are coming but they have no money they have no money and they don't think associations are important but when they get in their 30s baby members didn't think associations were important in their 20s none mm -hmm. so we're just just a mindset so they're coming so 
You need to build engagement strategy for Gen X okay. and you need to build awareness strategy, branding awareness strategy to, to, uh, to the millennials. So when millennials get to be 32 and 33, they're like, you know what? My, I just had a baby and my baby told me I don't know everything. So I need to join an association so I can figure it out, <laughs> you know? So, you know, so, but we all go through that. I mean, all, when the baby members were in their twenties, they thought they knew a lot you, and you learn, you get to the thirties and you're like, you know what? There's a whole lot more I can use an association to help me pro professionally progress. So they're going to come in droves, mm -hmm. but right now today, now think about it. They just reached 32. They're not going to be in the industry in mass until seven years from now. So what does your association do between now and the next seven years? Do you just hang out and wait for them? No, no. you develop <laughs> strategies no. to go after generations X is heart. You go after strategies to help keep baby boomers engaged in the process as long as they're in the industry and build something that Gen Y, when they get here, are excited to walk into and say, I want to be a part of that. Mm. Hmm. Okay. So, so all of that's really interesting. And I'm thinking about, I'm thinking about, what are the things that will speak to the hearts and minds of our Gen X people right now and uh, that will also connect and attract the people who are the Gen Y, I mean, I, or the, the millennials. And mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I imagine that there are some things that definitely connect them and whatever they're going through in life, they're going to be looking at what their leaders, and I'm speaking about like millennials, they're going to be looking at what their leaders who are probably in the Gen X range mm -hmm. and, uh, and beyond, um, what their thinking is important and what they're thinking it, it's critical that they're a part of our associations. And so how, so how should we be speaking to Gen X? What are the things that, that we should be doing to really be bringing them in? Well, you know, Gen X is in their highest income earning years that mm -hmm. you have in society. They're 33 to 55. Mm -hmm. And I think one simple thing associations can do is instead of saying millennial, 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 all I got to do is shift the messaging to we're here for Gen Xers. You're in, you got, you got a house, you got two kids, you, you're in that high stressed out environment. And we're here yeah. for you to take away the friction, anxiety, and stress out of your life. Why? Mm -hmm. Because we have all these resources in our association to help you do better. You have a connection with a network of people who are in the same mode of life as you. Gen Xers want to network. They love it. They want to create. They're rebellious at heart in a lot of cases. So that's you feed that and giving them leadership positions to help them feed that rebellion, that rebellious side of them where they can go out and really live their dream and their passion. Mm -hmm. So I, I, want people to get what they came here for. I want mm -hmm. them, I want to make sure that we deliver on our promise. Mm -hmm. and so since we're past half, half past the hour, I, I want to make sure that we speak to these six key elements that associations need to make, uh, to make 2017 their year. And so you're, you are the encyclopedia of information there. You have checklists, you have top threes, you have, these are the key things you need to know. And so for those folks who are listening at home or tuned in live right now uh, from offices and cars and wherever, um, what are those six key elements? So we've talked about a little bit of them um, already. So, so the first one is really be in that place of hope. Associate, we've come out of such a negative environment that I think members out there and any business, non-members even, they really want to be drawn to a, an organization that gives them hope to be successful in the future. And we talked about that hope being a, a group that has a hell of an attitude, that has optimism about the future, that has passion for the industry and what they do, and they drive energy into your soul when you're a part of them. You feel energized like, I can do this every single day. So that's, that's number one. Number two is having a clear and focused value proposition. And that goes back to that, that piece that I showed you, the octagon shape, having a clear and concise value proposition that speaks at the heart of what keeps people up at night and what reaches in and, and solves to a large degree, the friction, anxiety, and stress that goes on in people's businesses. Um, number four is that streamlined communication strategy I talked about where you're, you're got you have to communicate your content, but it's imperative that your content also develops your message and tells your story along the way. So people like if, if they didn't get your weekly email, they'd be like, oh, my gosh, I missed something. Yes. So you want you always want yes. to be creating um, good data, just like us sending out our, our quarterly reports on the 
27 industries and what their growth rates, that is so huge to our membership's um, success because they're making such large equipment purchases. So a clear and concise, um, and, and, and one thing on that is making your communication strategy streamlined and that you're not sending offline content different than online. They all read the same stuff. It's just how they read it. So what I, what I feel like we need to do is like MTI sends out four weekly, an email with every week with three um, articles in it. Our quarterly new, our monthly newsletter is made up of the 12 articles that were in our weekly e-news and our quarterly publication that goes out to a much larger audience is made up of articles that went through our newsletter. And we like that because repetition helps sell and get the message across. So streamlining that content um, is really good. The fifth thing is leveraging technology and video to grow without more people. Going back to what I talked about, Gen X, there aren't enough of them to hire. Even associations can't find good people to hire to work well. So what do you do if you want to grow your association program and services or your company 40% over the next eight years when there's no more, nobody to hire? Mm -hmm. It's imperative that you automate and use technology in ways that you've never used it before so you can grow your services without, you know, you can add on two or three more programs. So it's like training. Our training program does about 400 classes a month past. And we, it, we spend about one hour a month managing that process. Why? Because the technology works so well. So it's imperative that we, that you have a clear leverage uh, technology uh, and video proposal. The last one is the one that we just talked about to plan to engage Gen X today and then build the awareness campaign for Gen Y. So when they step into that hard open up, I'm ready to join because I actually saw value. They jump in right away because they've seen it. Hmm. Everybody's so upset that, that millennials aren't diving in, diving in. And they're talking to a generation who, when the baby boomers were 20, they didn't, as I said before, they didn't join. So they, they just need to be aware that they're coming, but they're coming over the next three to five years in droves. But you must, it's a must that you tag in to Gen X today. I love it. Okay. So, so I have a plan for the way that the rest of this discussion is going to go. I want to talk with you about uh, the goals. We mentioned this at the very beginning of our discussion about the goals, goal setting for 2017. But um, I want to leave a little bit of time in for a game that I want to play briefly at the end. And it's something that I just started doing on and off at the end of 2016. And I want to, I want to keep it going on. Uh, but for right now, uh, Mark Dorsey has a great question. And I bet I'm looking at the same question you is it? I'm how like, I want to ask. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. So how does the solopreneur economy impact your thinking, Tom? Is that the question you're looking at? Well, no, what I wanted to address Mark's uh, comments on us um, uh, passing things through a generational lens oh, in a yes, lot of cases. Yes, yes. I saw and, that, yeah. and just to speak to Mark's point, it's not really for me. It's, I just I compartmentalize generations because people can see that. But what most people don't realize, I look at it by the numbers, by the data. Right. So you have to, you can't argue that there's 13 million viewers. You could, I could have come on here and said 13 fewer people between these age brackets, but yeah. people generally get where those age brackets are when you say millennials Yeah. Um, and Gen X. So just to Mark's point, I don't want people to think that, that what I'm talking about really doesn't come through that lens. To, it yeah. comes through the data that shows that, look, we're on the verge of 32 year olds back to five years of age. There's a hundred million in them and they're coming this way. We just happen to call them millennials because that's what they are. Um, but they're going to change the shape of us. And then baby boomers are going to change the shape of many industries. You look at med the medical device industry, the funeral directors industry, unfortunately, hospice, RV, campsites. They're going to growth like you've never seen before because yeah. they're the second biggest generation. Yeah. I mean, I, so, I have to say that. And I took it. I, I must say that I took it in that that. I took it to that lens, I think, more with the question that I asked, the follow-up question that I asked, because um, about tailoring the the messaging and what is it that, that Gen X is more interested in. But it is true that just numbers-wise, with a few tweaks in, in the way that you communicate and really looking at things in a different way, um, the numbers speak for themselves. So that's mm -hmm. really what you're talking about there. Yeah, I mean, and, and there's opportunities to seize the moment and and because everybody is looking at how we've been told the future is not bright. The yeah. future could not be brighter with when you look at the numbers. I mean, the 80s and 90s were one of the most lucrative, materialistic 20-year spans in our history. 
but it's because it was driven by the baby boomers in their 30s and 40s and early 50s in those high income producing years. Mm -hmm. We're about to have 100 million of those people over the next 20 years jump into that sec that that age band. And we're going to see things we've never seen before. Yeah. But I, I want to go. I want to get before we. I want to. I want to go into Mark's question on sole sole entrepreneur. Yeah. I assume that means many people working for themselves mm -hmm. and developing their own job. Mm -hmm. um, so I heard a great. I heard a great um, uh, stat that right now I think it's like thirty five percent of people really kind of work for themselves, the entrepreneur kind of thing. They're not in a job. And mm -hmm. in the next five or so eight years, that number is going to jump to be close to 50%. So I do think um, in, a, in a society where a lot of people don't want to work for people. I mean, you have the Gen Xers who really, they don't, they don't like working the vertical. You know, they like being their own boss and stuff. And you look at the millennials, they really are kind of the same thing. And you see so many of them coming out working the dot coms and they're developing so many things on an innovation standpoint. And we're kind of reaching a society that I'd rather 1099 you. Yeah. And to have you yeah. work for me, because that brings a yeah. whole nother issue of health care, um, people problems and, and those kind of things. So I think, our man, our people need to study what does it mean to work with a bunch of contractors? Now, the other thing that's going to uh, unintended consequence, you look at Uber drivers. There's a whole market out there for CPAs who specifically go after Uber drivers because an Uber driver who's 22 has never gotten to write his car off before. He's never had business expenses. And so they don't really know how to maximize Uber driving to benefit them from a tax standpoint. So there's a whole market out there for CPAs that specifically market to Uber drivers and Lyft drivers and ride sharing to help them. So um, and those Uber drivers are that sole entrepreneur kind of thing. So I think between now and 2025, we're going to see more and more people as the economy um, expands you're going to see more and more one-on-one -on -one contracting type people that is going to um, take advantage of that for their own likelihood. I, and for I, me personally, yeah. I would say go for it, man, because there is nothing like working for yourself. Um, no. Agreed. Anyway, I would say uh, that I am now actively looking as of this discussion, anyone listening, I am now actively looking for guests to discuss and ideally like about three guests to have a discussion about what do you need to know to work better with contractors? <laughs> Can we talk about that? Can we, I think that would be awesome, but that's for another time. I'm putting that out there. You guys think of anything, let me know. You know, it would be even a hotter topic than that because so what? many people are looking to be the solopreneur yeah. is to talk about, have a set of three business owners that have, that do it and talk to you and I've had one-on-one -on -one discussions, but to have three yeah. people that really do, entrepreneuring very well as a business, a small business owner. Mm -hmm. And how do you do that? How do you, how do in you. In the association space or. Yeah, well, yeah. And, and like I'm a, I'm a one, I'm a, I'm a three person AMC. I run mm -hmm. my own company. I have one big client as well as speak around the country, but I run my own company and I think we do it pretty well, but to have three people that are talking to other, because think about it. I know of at least five people on my hand that have left their association and they're and they and they're trying to figure out do i go to another association or do i find my niche in the association space to be my own boss yeah they have all this knowledge and content and can really help associations but they don't really know kind of a steps one two and three how do i make that transition how do i make it sustainable i've seen a number of people jump out there and for 18 months they almost spend their savings trying to make it happen yeah. and when you look back at the at the decisions they made there's four things, Kiki, and this goes back to my professional development you stuff. Guys, are you catching this? He just did it again. Four things. I mean, I can talk. I, I might as well just sit here with a notebook. This is I'm a checklist that you guy. do this. I love it. So, I love so there's it. four things that will that will dominate and control 99% of your success personally and professionally. And it's the choices that you make every day. You got a why in the road. You're making a good or a bad choice. Sometimes the bad choice isn't a really bad choice. It's just not as good as the good choice. But because of our selfish wants and desires, we take that choice and ends up not being good. So the choices you make will dictate things. How you spend your money is going to be the second thing. You know, um, yeah. how, how you how you invest your time is the third thing. And the fourth thing is, um, is a you know, that fourth thing is escaping me. Oh, no. Uh, so it's all <laughs> oh, the people you surround yourself with, oh, the people yes, you surround okay. yourself with. Yep, that is the key sense. element. I know so many salespeople they get to Friday and they say, man, I didn't make any sales this week. And my first question is, how many calls did you make this week? And they're like, I made two. So they didn't spend the time they needed in the investment process 
of getting new customers in order to get those calls. Mm. But those four things, time, money, choices, and who you surround yourself with will dictate everything in your personal and professional life. That's fascinating. And actually, that's a great uh, segue into talking a little bit about uh, what I wanted to ask you, which is how you're going to make your 2017 even better than last year for yourself personally, for your career, for your association. Talk to me, Tom. What, what have you done? I know you have uh, set out to make 2017 even better. So how, how are you going about goal setting? Well, you know, I look at life as like a game and, mm -hmm. and there's a competitive factor in it. And the competition is everything that wants to get in the way of you being a success story. Mm -hmm. And there's this great video online um, and you can go out there and probably YouTube uh, just type in what is it? Um, what does it take to be successful? Uh, and what it is, is this guy telling a story and this young guy comes to him and he says, I would like to be a successful guy just like you. And he says, well, meet me out at the beach tomorrow dressed up, takes him out to the beach. And he says, follow me into the water. And he follows him into the water. He says he starts freaking out because he's, he's up to his waist in water. He gets him out above his head. He pushes him down under the water. And the guy is scampering to try and breathe. And he finally lets him up. And he, he, and, and he says, what were you doing? He says, what were you trying to do? He says, I wanted to get some air. He says, that's, you were so laser focused on wanting to get air that you left all distractions beside you. And he says, when the moment you want to breathe and be successful as much as you want to breathe, that's when you'll start being successful. Hmm. As much as you want to give up parting or give up this, give away all the distractions to be laser focused on achieving what you want, that is when you're actually going to accomplish it. So every year, me and my wife sit down over wine and we talk about our goals in four specific areas. Okay. And what do we want to do better relationally? That's not just us. That's, you know, friends. We're, our goal this year is to have at least two dinners a month with couples that we don't know very well in our neighborhood to get to know people in our neighborhood well. So we, we have a relational goal. We have a financial goal. We want to be 100% debt free of excluding our house by the end of the year. Mm -hmm. So we're going to try and accomplish that so we can do some other fun things with our money. Mm -hmm. So we have a financial goal. We have a career goal. I have a career goal of working, uh, making 25 speaking engagements this year. So I have a goal that's going to hopefully drive the financial stuff, but just helps me. I want to develop that brand of speaking. And, and I have career goals at my association. We, you know, we've got new memberships and stuff. And then the fourth goal is health. You know, if we are such an out of shape society and I want to be, I want to be there. I just held my grandson at Christmas day. He's seven months old and I want to be there to hold his son. 25 years from now or whenever it happens, yeah. but I can't do that without having a goal to be healthy and eat healthy and work out and do stuff. So I think everybody, and this is in my book I wrote that you should have a goal in those four key areas of life every year and don't make them monumental because mm -hmm. you have to solve the problem, the world today, just make them four goals that between now and next year, next New Year's Eve, you look back and say, my life is a better place because mm -hmm. that's what it's about is quality of life. Work is just a way for us to finance where we want to go, but it's what we feel every day when we wake up and look in the mirror at ourselves and then look at our spouse and look at our kids and just do we feel good about where we are? And I, you know, if you don't have goals, you never know if you're good, if you're, if you're satisfied or not. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. I tell you what, every time I talk with you, I come away richer for it. So thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. So I'm, I'm, that's not wrapping it up, but it would have been good, but I'm not done with you yet. <laughs> Okay, so um, I want to do a quick game before I close out. And everyone, everyone who's watching live, uh, what do you think? Are you getting some good points from this? What are some of your takeaways? Why don't you, you know, uh, just share them over here in the chat area? But I want to play a little game. It's a little word association game. I got this from the cool guys over at Through the Noise podcast. And if you haven't listened to this podcast, it's awesome. Um, they, it's an audio podcast. You can subscribe to it on iTunes, Stitcher, you know, whatever your favorite, uh, whatever your favorite podcast listening uh, pleasure might be. But uh, through the noise, and they are focused on associations. And I happen to have a new podcast with them. It's sort of a spinoff that is launching in January. Audio podcast. You'll also be able to find it on iTunes and everywhere else. But these guys, their their podcast through the noise is amazing, and they do this really cool game at the end that is word association. So I'm going to call out three different words, Tom, and I want you to just tell tell us 
the first thing that comes to mind, and, I don't, and I'm kind of scared doing this with you because I don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> well, it will be unfiltered. All right. All so you're right. going to say one at a time and you want me to say after you say each one? That's right. That's okay. right. We'll just take, we'll pause a little bit just to consider it and then we'll move okay. on to the next one. All right. So the first one, thought leader. I would have to say, uh, I have to say Mark Dorsey, my friend online. Yeah. I, I love li listening to him talk and we talk about, um, he's such a big picture thinker. I think we lack big picture thinking people in association world in a large degree. They're so focused on the day to day. And when him and I talk, I mean, it's like, I love it because he's talking yeah. strategy and how you attack things. So I think Mark is a very good thought leader. He's got an excellent mind. I'd love to. And Mark, I, I since I have your attention now, uh, I would love to have you on in 2017. So we definitely have to make that happen. Um, that's a good one. Okay. Next one. Weird. You know, I would really have to just look in the mirror and say myself. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm a weird sort, you know, I, I don't, I don't, I don't, I, uh, I strike a lot of people good, but you know, I tend to think that, you know, if you're not rubbing 10% of the world around you wrong, you're not pushing the envelope hard enough and far enough. And, um, you know, I think we all got to have a little weirdness. So I'd have to yeah. say myself. Awesome. I love it. Okay. And <laughs> I think the, the next one that I want to hit the future. Um, you better get on it today. Be prepared. All right. I like now, it. Now, did, did you want, did you want someone when I, when you say the future or you hey, want to it's word association? It's whatever. Naturally yeah. I, I, my, my big word is now. Now. Yeah. When I talk to people about uh, the very first five minutes on any of my keynotes is the future is running at us faster and at rapid pace more than we've ever seen it in the past. And you can never, you can't gingerly walk towards it because it's going to run you over. So to me, the future is absolutely now. Yeah, absolutely. Fantastic. I love that. I think that uh, for me, I am really, I, I read that uh, book by, um, Oh, Angela Duckworth called Grit at the end of last year. Mm -hmm. And um, so resilience, like I've been really focused on that word resilience, you know, but uh, hopefully I won't have to struggle so much to experience resilience. Right. But if I do, I'm there. All right. So thank you so much, Tom. This has been absolutely amazing. And, and thanks to everyone for joining us for the first episode of 2017 for Association Chat. Kick it off, Kiki. Yeah, I know. Well, you have to kick it off the right way, right? And who better to help me do that than Tom Morrison? So um, thanks for coming back to the chat, Tom, and, and giving us more great advice to make this our year. And I think that 2017 is going to be amazing. And I have proof because the next two episodes of Association Chat, our next two uh, topics are going to uh, be behind the scenes with ASAE's Gold Circle Awards. So we're going to be talking to some of the organizers, the people who judge, and the people who win these types of awards um, coming up next week. Tuesday at 2 p.m. Eastern. The week after that, we're going to be talking about diversity and inclusion challenges for associations with Sean Boynes, who um, he is kind of the poster child for ASAE lately, or certainly if you look at, I think he's on some of the publications that they put out for the foundation. Um, great guy. So if you want to talk to an executive director who, who knows a lot and will also make you laugh and make you smile, he's your guy. And I hope you join us for that. That's on the 17th. And you guys, I hope you have had fun with us today and learned something that will help you and your association. Yay, lucky you. Uh, now- Look, I say one thing, Kiki? Yeah, yeah, I'll just, let you say- Just real quick. Yeah, sure. um, just one, I know there's probably some people around here that may think, you know, does Tom bring his energized, weird self uh, in a good, positive way to associations? And I just want to let everybody know that if you are looking for a great keynote that's passionate and brings great data to your members, not just associations, I speak to many different industries. You can go to tommorrison.biz and check out promo videos for your education team and whoever and my uh, contact information on there. would love the opportunity to work with anybody that's, that's on the line. It's good, good information stuff. Every association I've been before 
says it really opened their eyes to what they need to be thinking for the future. Yeah, and you know, while we're at it, I'm just gonna, on a personal note, I'm gonna share a little, a little truth with you guys. And that is that over the years being in the association space, I've met a lot of people and I've been fortunate to know Tom and had had him in my sphere of, you know, my 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 collection of friends for a while, my network. And I, I will meet people who don't know me at all and will say uh, things like, oh, well, Tom told me to talk to you. Tom always checks in with. I have met people he has mentored. I have met people who uh, missed the last time he was on the chat and wanted to make sure that they caught wherever the recording was. I mean, people really speak highly of your engagement, Tom, and the way that you impact their lives. So good on you. Because I want them to scream my name and beg for more. Well, there you go. Book. <laughs> Get the book. Get the book. And Mike McCarthy, thanks. I'm glad that as a first time participant, you enjoyed yes. it. I hope you come back. Everyone, I really hope you enjoyed this. Share this with your friends. If you like association chat, please consider sharing it with your friends. Number one pl place to be on Tuesdays. Absolutely. You wouldn't want to be anywhere else. Share it with your colleagues. Uh, follow us on the Association Chat Facebook group. Join that group for regular updates on upcoming topics and special guests. And let me tell you, we have started the year off right. We will see you next week. Thanks, everyone. Ow. All right. <laughs> Bye, yeah. Tom. Thank you. That was really good. Take care, Kiki. All right. Take care. Bye, everybody.